So what is uh, resonance? Uh? So resonance, uh, by definition, uh, the f is a phenomenon in which a system responds at maximum amplitude to an external dri driving force when the driving force frequency is equal to the natural frequency of the driven system. So what it actually means is like this. Lah, that uh, in a force oscillation, uh, if the driving frequency, uh, the driving force frequency is equal to the natural frequency, there will be maximum energy absorption. And what will happen is the system will respond with maximum amplitude. Example, uh, you know when you uh, dating, uh, you always sit on the swing one. Right, right. You sit on the swing, right, right. and then your boyfriend will push you, right? right. Okay, so uh, what will happen is uh, your boyfriend must push you uh, at the correct timing, one, right? Not any time he like, right? right. Alright, so let's say, uh, well, yes, you a guy, your boyfriend. Right? Okay, so let's say you uh, let's say he push you, so when you come back to him, then he push you. Then you go and come back, and you, then only he push you, right? So when must he push you? When you when he comes back to you, only he yeah, only he must push you. So that means uh, the your natural frequency is the frequency that you're swinging on your own. The forcing frequency is the frequency that he's pushing you. So the frequency that he push you must match the frequency they are swinging. So then you will get maximum energy absorption, and then you will respond by having the biggest amplitude. Lah. Understand? Lah? If let's say uh, he's very lazy, he only push you like uh, once in every three times, all right, then will you go very high? Yeah. Or let's say he's too hardworking, uh, he miss you so much, he push you, uh, you haven't come back, he run towards you and push you again. <laughs> right, okay, you're pushing you so many times that even though you haven't finished one round, uh, so you also won't go very high, right? Uh? Right, so that's why uh, uh, resonance will only occur when the forcing frequency equals the natural frequency. Understand? Uh? So in a short while, uh, we will see this uh, experiment, uh, the video. So where what we have is uh, we have a row of our pendulums attached to, the, to a common string. And then this pendulum, X, uh, is the one that we will start to swing first. So we will displace this by pulling to one side. And then when we let go, it will start to swing. Right? When it starts to swing, it will cause this string to twist because it's tied to the string. So when this string twists, it will drag all these pendulums together. So when they start to oscillate, which one will undergo the biggest oscillation is D because it has the same natural frequency. Now how do I know these two have the same natural frequency? Because the natural frequency of a pendulum uh, depends on the length of the string and also acceleration of gravity only. It doesn't depend on mass. Uh. So even though these two have different mass, it doesn't matter. Uh. It only depends on these two. So since both of them have the same length, therefore they must have the same natural frequency. So when this swings, the string will twist according to this frequency which matches this natural frequency, so this will have the biggest amplitude. The rest of them will be smaller. The further away from the natural frequency, the smaller the amplitude. That means these two, the amplitude will be slightly smaller than this. These two will be even smaller than this, and this will be the smallest. Okay, so you'll get to see that video in the next uh, slide. Alright, so now uh, we will actually uh, get to see how these, uh, these uh, pendulums actually look in real life. So if we were to uh, look at uh, what we have here, we we'll notice that this is the string which you tie all the pendulums on uh, onto, all right. But um, you will notice that it actually sags. So in real life, of course, the string will sag because of the weight of these pendulums. But in the diagrams that in the, the diagram that you saw in the previous slide, it didn't sag. It's because they just wanted to show you um, which two pendulums had the same length. So when it sags, it's hard to see. But anyway, uh, this is how it looks in real life. Just now, one was just an illustration. Right? So these two pendulums have actually the same length. So that means these two pendulums have the same natural frequency. So as what uh, we said just now, we will displace this first. So as this swings uh, back and forth, it will twist the string here. And it will then uh, cause uh, the rest of the pendulums to start swinging. And I want you to pay attention to this pendulum. You will notice that it will swing the most because it has the same natural frequency as this. Now these two will have slightly a uh, smaller amplitudes followed by this and this. This will have the smallest uh, amplitude, so we'll get to see in a short while. All right. Okay. So now, um, okay. So I want you to pay attention. This is how we, uh, it starts to swing now. So now look at this. Now can you see that this pendulum starts to swing with the biggest amplitude? 
all right, followed by these two, and then followed by this, and this has the smallest amplitude. Now, uh, of course, there's a slight delay. It's because when this pendulum starts to swing, it will drag the string along, then which in turn drags the pendulum. So there's a slight delay. And we see from the side, you will see that this pendulum is actually moving the most. All right, so that is uh, the example of resonance. So when you want to uh, plot the graph, right, that shows resonance, it's actually this graph. It's called the resonance curve. So what does the resonance curve show you? So what does the resonance curve show you, right? It shows you how the amplitude varies with frequency. What frequency? The drying frequency. So if you try to imagine this, this is the amplitude of you swinging back and forth on the swing. This is the frequency at which I am pushing you. This is the amplitude of you swinging back and forth, the frequency I'm pushing you. So you just have to look at one of the curve. La. Let's say we look at one of these. Because uh, these are all different degrees of damping. Uh. Let's look at the first one first. Let's look at this one. Uh, light damping on now. Uh. You notice that if I push you, my drying frequency is lower than your natural frequency. Because you have a natural frequency. That means I push you one time. Then I wait. You go back and forth three times. Then I push you again. That means my frequency that I'm pushing you is one third of your natural frequency. Then... Of course, you won't be very high because I push you one time, I let you go but do yourself another two times. Know, so you cannot go very high. So, yeah, push me more times, la, you know, so, so, so small and pretty. Okay, I say, okay, hard working a bit, I increase the frequency. Rate. Now I push you alternate cycles, miss half the frequency. Alright, so this natural frequency, I push you half the natural frequency. So I push you one time, you go and come back. Second time, you go and come back, then I push you again. That means I push you one time, you go and come back, I still ignore you first. Then you go again and come back and then I push you. That's called alternate cycles. Huh? Then you still go higher. That's why your amplitude will go higher, but not as high as you can actually go. Lah. So the best is I push you at your natural frequency. Every time you come back to me, I push you. Every time you come back to me, I push you. Every time you come back to me, I push you. Then you will have maximum energy absorption. Then you have the highest amplitude. But if let's say I try to be too hard working, I push you at a higher frequency than natural frequency. That means you are coming, you go already, you haven't come back to me, you are just halfway, I quickly run and push you. You should stop what? Or slow down what? So the amplitude will drop again. So it's not to say the higher the frequency, the always matter. You must match. Too low, too high, no, 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 uh, it's not good. It's not good, huh? It will be smaller amplitude. So that's called resonance curve. So how to show resonance is by drawing this graph. Just one of it. So if I were to draw one of it, you would just have to draw like this, huh? You draw amplitude versus frequency and just draw a maximum graph. Like that, huh? Just draw a maximum graph. Like, not so sharp, huh? Okay, now this will be your natural frequency, lah. F not lah. Now what happens if there's damping? So how do you increase the damping of a system without significantly changing the natural frequency? It means you don't alter the system; you just want to have more damping. The best way is always by increasing air resistance. So you are sitting on a swing. I ask you to hold a big piece of cardboard. If let's say it's a mass spring system moving up and down, I stick a horizontal piece of cardboard. If it's moving up and down, so horizontal piece of cardboard will increase air resistance. If the simple pendulum swinging back and forth, I also can put down cardboard. Right? Mm -hmm. So if I change the, uh, I mean, if I increase the damping by using uh, air resistance, that wouldn't change the natural frequency much. Okay. So what will happen? They'll ask you to draw the graph. How does your graph of resonance look like? Now, three things you must realize. Uh, see, when I draw this graph, uh, they are, I, I'm consciously making uh, three things about this huh? oh yeah wait huh? we had to draw okay something like this so the first thing you'll notice is that the peak becomes smaller the highest point is smaller naturally ma, higher damping more energy loss you can never be as high as before if you're holding a piece of cardboard obviously you cannot go so high one. now second thing is you'll notice that the peak shifts a little to the left Alright, that means the peak or the resonance is happening at a slightly lower frequency. Slightly. Lah. So why is it slightly lower frequency? It's because with increased damping, you're moving slower. Lah. So your period is longer. So since your period equals 1 over F, so your period is longer, your natural frequency drops a little. So the natural frequency drops a little, so I must give a forcing frequency that is slightly less as well. Understand? For this graph, you must show. The earlier graph, when you're drawing the displacement or the amplitude versus time remember that one mm. uh, the damping also we just draw but uh, we maintain the same amplitude the same period uh. so for this one you don't have to show increase period or uh, but for this you want to show increase period because this one's harder to show this one easier to show okay right the third thing 
is the graph gets flatter. Now consciously, uh, this one is a sharper point, but this is a flatter point. So why does it get flatter? It means uh, that for amplitudes that are small, the damping causes the amplitude to drop a little bit early. But when the amplitude is big, the damping causes a big drop. When the amplitude is small, damping causes a small drop. Why? Uh? Because of air resistance again. Because I was telling you, amplitude big, you're moving faster. Hold a big a piece of cardboard, big difference, because you're moving fast. Amplitude small, you're moving slow. So I ask you to hold a big a piece of cardboard, it does affect you, but not as much. So you must draw these three things up. Uh? Pick smaller, pick shifts to the left, and your graph gets flatter. So I must see a distinct difference. Small amplitude, the difference is small. Big amplitude bigger, then get smaller in the difference. Uh. Okay, so that is the graph of uh, resonance. Okay, another thing uh, that remember I was telling you that this graph is actually flatter. Mm -hmm. So this is related to sharpness of response. So what the sharpness of response mean? It means uh, that when your damping is uh, low, right? Okay, damping is low, like in this case here, compared to here, it's high damping. When damping is low, we call it a sharp response, meaning to say, uh, remember this is the frequency that you must give it to get resonance? If the forcing frequency is slightly higher or slightly lower, then the amplitude drops significantly. It drops a lot. So a little bit not correct frequency, then the amplitude is very much different. But you compare it to heavy damping, okay, you compare it to heavy damping, uh, if I were to give it a frequency slightly bigger or slightly smaller, the amplitude is about the same. So it's called a flat response. That means it seems like a lot of frequencies also doesn't matter, you know, around the natural frequency, not exact also doesn't matter, the amplitude is still about the same. It's called a flat response. But of course you don't get a very big amplitude, lah, but it is a more forgiving system. So the tuning of radio and TV uh, that we will talk about in the next slide, they want a sharp response. Lah, so that matches exactly get a very big amplitude doesn't match cut, can cut off because it's very small okay so uh, one of the things uh, they will also ask you uh, is are the, are the examples where resonance is useful and also where or uh, resonance should be avoided uh. so you want to talk about when it is useful right we can talk about um, using microwaves to cook food because microwaves, microwave ovens uh, they actually uh, use microwave right now uh, but the frequency that they use that actually matches the natural frequency of vibration of water molecules in your food. So when the microwave passes through your food, uh, because the water molecules have the same natural frequency as the frequency of the microwave, then resonance so it vibrate faster. So when the molecules vibrate faster, Ke goes up. And according to uh, our physics, uh, when the Ke goes up, temperature goes up. That's why the food is cooked at a very high temperature. Then it's faster. That's why you notice why you cook food using microwave oven is so fast because temperature that you achieve is very very high higher than you can even use charcoal fire or gas fire that's why you can cook food very fast but the downside is at very high temperatures right uh, bonds between molecules may break so you know like your carbo your proteins all have bonds huh? so when they break and form back they may form different bonds from the original that can become carcinogenic huh? but we don't have to say that that's only for information huh? so next time you should avoid for using microwaves right not right another one is a tuning of radio and tv la. so when is how do you use resonance right for example you're sitting in a car but you get to select whichever radio station you want right now so how come you can select whatever radio station you want now the same aerial in your car is the one receiving all the stations so if your car aerial in your uh, in your car aerial is actually receiving all the signals simultaneously right? But you pick which one you, you want to listen to. How? Huh? Now, when the radio waves uh, reach your aerial, it will induce an EMF in your aerial. Why? Huh? Because radio waves are electromagnetic waves. That means they have alternating electric and magnetic fields. So the alternating magnetic field component will uh, induce an EMF in your aerial according to Faraday's law. And that induced EMF will have the same uh, frequency as your radio wave. So that means at single time, uh, you have multiple radio waves being received by your area, which is channeled to your radio right now. So your radio has an electronic oscillator that is oscillating at whatever frequency you set. For example, if you're listening to Hits FM, you set to 92.9 MHz. So it will cause the electrons to go back and forth 92.9 million times per second. So what will happen is all the different signals are all like, remember all your different pendulum lengths? Some long, some short. And then the frequency that you are forcing the electrons to go back and forth is your forcing frequency. 
So uh, all the signals uh, will be uh, will be what you call it uh, forced uh, to oscillate sort of lah by the electrons. But which one will undergo resonance? The frequency of the EMF that matches your forcing frequency. So which is the uh, the EMF coming from ninety two point nine megahertz station. So that will undergo resonance. So you will get to amplify that the biggest. So all the others will be very little only. So when they're very little, then what happens is they can use a filter to cut off all these low power signals. So you only get the high power signal, which is your 92.9 megahertz. Alright, so that's how resonance is used. Lah. But in your exam, you don't have to go into so detail. You just have to say, using microwaves to cook food, you can say tuning of radio and TV, that's it. Okay, now what about examples where resonance should be avoided? Now. Resonance can cause destruction. First, first one is during earthquakes. Huh? Now you notice huh, that um, whenever you have a building right on the ground, it acts like a cantilever. That means, uh, like a beam, uh, fixed at one end and free at the end. So if you give it a push at that, it will start to oscillate back and forth. So there is a natural frequency of oscillation. During earthquakes, right, the ground will shake like this. So if the frequency of the ground shaking matches your natural frequency, then you get resonance and you collapse. Huh? So that is the problem. So how we overcome? The first thing is, the 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 height of your building are uh, actually one of the main factors that determine your natural frequency besides the material and all that lah. So what happens is if you know the frequency of the earth shaking during earthquakes, because if yours is an earthquake prone area, you will have data over multiple terms earthquakes uh, so you can measure the frequency. So you make sure that the natural frequency doesn't match this frequency. So you can either make it taller or shorter. Okay, the first thing you can do. The other thing you can do is what the Taipei 101 building did. Because uh, Taipei 101 building in Taiwan, right, is a very tall building, one of the tallest in the world, uh, but not the tallest, right? But it is located very near to a major fault line. That means where the uh, plates tend to shift. Uh, so it's located very near uh, to the major fault line. So whenever there's a shift in the plate, then the, amp then the amplitude of vibration near to the fault line is actually the biggest. So it's actually very near. So how did they prevent it from falling, right? So what they did was they inserted steel steel columns uh, from top to bottom, all around it, like spines like that. All around it. But why they use steel? Uh, it's because steel is ductile. You can bend steel and it won't break. But if your building is only made of concrete or bricks, it may be strong, hard to break, but the moment you bend it, it will break. So therefore, by put pouring concrete all over this uh, what you call it as steel columns when the time of earthquake when this building sways the steel column will prevent the whole building from collapsing so the windows all because they're brittle will break lah, no problem the, the walls may crack a bit but the building will never collapse because of these steel columns you can say that lah. now the second example of uh, destructive resonance is the case of a suspension bridge lah. now if you look at the suspension bridge which is you know like your Penang bridge right where you have this, uh, yeah, let me draw for you. There is this deck here, where the cars go through. All right, and then they will be suspended using steel wires. They got another one. Then you suspend here, right? Uh? So this is called suspension bridge, uh. So when the wind uh, comes and hits the sides, uh, that means the we call it the sides the, or the deck of the bridge here. It has no way to go because it's flat, so it gets blocked by the flat surface, the wind gets blocked. So where does it go? It turns back. So the British call it the eddies. Uh, right? The Americans call it vortices. Uh, right? The Malaysians call it tornadoes. Uh, no, uh. <laughs> Actually not a tornado, uh, but it looks like that. Uh, it goes back. But it's very small. Yeah. So what will happen is it will cause this bridge to start to twist because this one uh, is a twisting motion. And this bridge is also like a ruler. You can actually twist it sideways and then you just but it just oscillate. So if the frequency of these eddies uh, that is formed matches the natural frequency of this, then resonance will occur, then it will twist bigger and bigger and it will collapse. So how did they overcome this? Now when they when this first happened, they panicked. Because it happened in Tacoma Narrow Bridge. So straight away they try to increase the stiffness. How they increase the stiffness? By making this kind of bars. Uh. Have you seen not uh, underneath the bridges? They put in extra metal uh, structure underneath they call it stiffening truss all right from here to here so make it stiffer 
But this type of stiffening truss is not um, for long term. You know why? Because it's heavy. And it adds to the weight of the deck. So then your cables which are supporting it have a maximum load. Ma, so fewer cars can pass through because the whole weight of the deck is heavier. Mm -hmm. On top of it, your, your steel is expensive. Ha? Metal is expensive. So the, the, the permanent solution that now they came up with is to make the deck of the bridge like this, aerodynamic, like this. That means instead of flat, they make it aerodynamic, like this, like this. Imagine, this is a sharp point. So that when the wind hits it, it will go above and below it. So then you don't have any, sir. so don't make it flat, but make it aerodynamic. Okay, so that's how you overcome this resonance. You'll memorize this, uh, how to overcome as well, okay? So this one, you've got to memorize a bit more than your uh, useful. Because you've got to mention how it causes destruction and how to overcome. Alright, so in, uh, in this video, we will get to see uh, the problem uh, with the bridge oscillating, uh, as we mentioned in the previous slide. So let's look at uh, what happens um, uh, when the wind actually hits the deck of the bridge. Remember we said that the deck of the bridge is... Uh, flat so when the wind hits it it has nowhere to go except to go turn back huh, other than top or bottom uh, which what the, we said that forms eddies or vortices so this caused the bridge to twist so there's actually oscillating right so it's actually oscillating quite long, uh, quite uh, violently and uh, so happened there was only one uh, car left on the bridge and uh, actually the man escaped uh, but um, on that day there were actually many uh, uh, video set up uh, uh, mainly because uh, this bridge was already oscillating quite violently before this day when the bridge broke so they actually set up a lot of cameras or many cameras right to actually record uh, the the bridge oscillating to find to try to figure out what was wrong and on that day they managed uh, to capture this uh, footage and uh, on this day it actually swayed them uh, actually uh, oscillate the most and actually it broke finally <laughs> So this was the end result, and finally the bridge broke.